The Rachel Maddow Show, weeknights at 9 Eastern on MSNBC. In August 1996, a man who was not a religious official of any kind, a man who had no authority to do it, decided that he nevertheless would issue a holy order, a religious command. He would issue a fatwa. That man's name was Osama bin Laden. And in 1996, he issued this self-styled fatwa, which he called a declaration of war against the Americans occupying the land of the two holy places. Now, the land of the two holy places uh, is Saudi Arabia, the two holy places being Mecca and Medina. Uh, Osama bin Laden was, of course, a Saudi citizen, and his whole first declaration of war on the United States hinged on the fact that the United States had military bases in the land of the two holy places in Saudi Arabia. So that was 1996. Then two years later, the second bin Laden and Al-Qaeda fatwa, uh, well, the first one, I guess, had been a little rambly, but this one spelled it out much more directly. It said everybody should try to kill Americans, both American military personnel and civilians. And the justification for doing that started in the same place as the fatwa before. The one in 1998 says, first, for over seven years, the United States has been occupying the lands of Islam in the holiest of places, the Arabian Peninsula. So this one was 1998. And since the first Iraq war, since the first, you know, the Gulf War, seven years earlier, the United States had been maintaining military bases in Saudi Arabia, which he calls the Arabian Peninsula, the land of the two holy places. And that fact that there were U.S. bases in Saudi Arabia, that apparently drove Osama bin Laden nuts. So, fatwa. Drive the infidel armies out of our holy Saudi Arabia. Wage war on the Saudi rulers for letting the Americans be here. So it was fatwa one in 1996 saying, get U.S. bases out of Saudi Arabia. Then it was fatwa two in 1998 saying, get U.S. bases out of Saudi Arabia. And then three years later, in 2001, it was 9-11. And we do not talk about this very often, but one of the things the United States did after 9-11 was get the U.S. bases out of Saudi Arabia. And they did it at a time when, honestly, the world was sort of distracted. We invaded Iraq, which had nothing to do with al-Qaeda or 9-11, uh, on March 19th of that year. And then we announced that we were pulling our bases out of Saudi Arabia on April 29th, that same year. In fact, you might remember something else happening that same week in the news because we very quietly announced that we were pulling U.S. military bases out of Saudi Arabia on a Tuesday. And then on Thursday, President George W. Bush declared mission accomplished in our very young war in Iraq. Osama bin Laden's big demand was that we pull U.S. bases out of Saudi Arabia. And President George W. Bush pulled U.S. bases out of Saudi Arabia. Two decades earlier, we'd gone through a similar kind of thing. In 1983, there was a huge suicide truck bomb that was driven into the U.S. Marine barracks at the airport in Beirut, in Lebanon. Six months earlier, there had been another big suicide car bomb attack, not on a barracks, but on the U.S. Embassy in the same city. 63 people killed at the embassy, including 17 Americans. At the barracks bombing, the toll was almost unimaginable. 299 dead overall, including 220 U.S. Marines, 18 American sailors, three American soldiers, nearly 60 of our allied French troops, the Americans and the French and troops from a lot of other countries were there. They were in Beirut of, as part of what was supposed to be an international peacekeeping force, trying to stop or at least mitigate the effects of a civil war that was raging in that country. And the bombings were a terrorist message that those international troops should get out. Get out, you infidel occupying armies. We do not want you in our country. Pull out the peacekeepers. Then President Ronald Reagan responded by pulling out the peacekeepers. This is an NBC News special. Reagan pulls back the Marines. Here is NBC News correspondent Tom Brokaw. Good evening. President Reagan tonight ordered a major change in his Lebanon policy, a phased pullback of American Marines from their airport positions to ships just offshore. Ronald Reagan pulled the Marines out of Lebanon. George W. Bush pulled the bases out of Saudi Arabia. Those presidents have not gone down in history as guys who surrendered to terrorism, but that is part of the way that they responded. It's important to think of this in terms of the overall spectrum here, right? I mean, terrorism is incoherent. 
It's not like Osama bin Laden after 2003 said, oh, hey, look, I told America to get those bases out of Saudi Arabia, and they did. So now we're cool and I'm ready to hug it out, right? That, d d pulling the bases out of Saudi Arabia did not assuage him, even though he'd been demanding it, did not assuage his desire to kill Americans for whatever point he was trying to make with his vocation, right? Terrorism is incoherent. Yesterday, we got a lecture from a guy covered in blood and holding a meat cleaver saying his beef with the West was that he felt unfairly labeled as an extremist. Extremist. The man covered in blood holding a knife said that. Terrorism is incoherent. And as such, there is no magic policy that you should obviously and definitely do in response to it that you can be assured will have the desired effect of stopping it. You can try to capture or kill committed terrorists. You can try to disrupt their plots. You can try to disrupt their organizational structure and their means of communication to screw up their planning to try to catch more of them. You can sneak spies into their groups, the way the FBI and all those great gangster movies sneaks a mole into the mob or flips a guy on the inside to try to get all the evidence and wrap them all up in a big sting operation. You can try to reduce the appeal of their ideology so they have fewer new recruits. And so you increase the chances that anyone anywhere in the world who finds that terrorist groups are operating in their midst will feel more likely to turn them in. You can do all of that. You can try to take away some of the things that they are complaining about. You can try to harden yourself as a target so you are less easy to hit. And so the casualty numbers will be reduced if they do hit again. There, there is stuff that you can do, but you can do all of those things. You can do things that people think are a mistake. You can do things that people think look like surrendering. You can do things that people think are very, very, very tough. You can do a whole range of things, but you will still find, no matter what you do, that there is still terrorism in the world. And you will find that there is still anti-American terrorism in the world, born from more or less coherent ideologies borne out by more or less competent practitioners. And it will be sometimes less and sometimes more, but never entirely will it be susceptible to counterterrorism policies and strategies. There is no one policy or strategic response that is compelled by an act of terrorism because it's guaranteed to work. Nothing is guaranteed to work. And there's a lot of terrorism all over the world. And in our own history, there's a lot of terrorism. I mean, terrorism on U.S. soil did not start with 9-11. I mean, as President Obama noted in his landmark speech today, calling for an end to the Bush-era construct of the global war on terror, the continuum of terrorism that we have faced as Americans includes things like the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995 and that barracks bombing in Lebanon and the embassy bombing there a few months before. The Boston Marathon bombing, the Lockerbie bombing in 1988, the Fort Hood attack, the Sikh Temple mass shooting, the Achille Loro hijacking in 1985, and, 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 and. It's not like America has never been confronted by terrorism before. But when 9-11 happened, when that specific instance of terrorism happened, the previous presidential administration decided that the response this time around was going to be war. War that would be indefinite, that would be geographically unconstrained, and war that would be waged in a way that was sort of designed to be as low impact as possible for our civilian population. We got a huge round of tax cuts in this country a few weeks before 9-11. Then once 9-11 happened and we invaded Afghanistan, we kept the tax cuts anyway. How did we think we were going to pay for that war? Did we think it was free? Then when we started a second simultaneous war in another country, we gave ourselves a second huge round of tax cuts. After that second war started, the wars, I guess, we thought would be free. Don't worry about it, civilians. Go about your business. But it wasn't just the tax cuts and these other implicit means of insulating all of us civilians from the war so the war could go on without much noticing or caring. It was also the direct shielding of us from knowledge of the war by waging a lot of it in secret. And so after the Bush and Cheney years, when we got a new president, he came into office. Some new decisions were made. One of the two conventional wars that was started after 9-11 was ended. They said they would end the war in Iraq, and they did. The other war, the war in Afghanistan, is still ongoing, but it also is slowly, slowly, very slowly being ended. Outside those two conventional battlefields, the new administration did not just keep up, they expanded the use of lethal action around the world in the name of fighting terrorism. Operationally, they kept that up more aggressively than ever. That aggression made it possible to find and kill bin Laden himself. But while they operationally kept it up and expanded it, they also did sort of get less secret about it over time. 
incrementally. March 2010, just over a year after the new administration took office, the famous human rights lawyer from Yale, who the administration had put in as the top legal advisor to the State Department, he gave the first speech explaining why the administration thought it was legal to kill people without a trial. He said, effectively, because it is war. Then March 2012, the Attorney General, Eric Holder, he gives another speech explaining that, yes, that applies to even American citizens. April 2012, the top lawyer at the CIA gives a speech saying that even if the CIA does it and no one in the U.S. government will therefore admit to it, they still think it's legal. Later that same month, the president's counterterrorism advisor, who's now the head of the CIA, he gives a speech that for the first time admits that when we are killing people, we are killing people with drones. November 2012, the top lawyer at the Pentagon, Jay Johnson, goes to England to give a speech in which he makes the case that everything the administration has been doing is legal under the laws of war, but he says, this war cannot last forever. It has to end. And now today, last in a long series, we get the culmination. We get the president himself stating that, yeah, the war's got to end. War cannot be forever or it's not war anymore. It's something else. Our commitment to constitutional principles has weathered every war, and every war has come to an end. We must define the nature and scope of this struggle, or else it will define us. We have to be mindful of James Madison's warning that no nation could preserve its freedom in the midst of continual warfare. We must define our effort not as a boundless global war on terror, but rather as a series of persistent targeted efforts to dismantle specific networks of violent extremists that threaten America. A perpetual war through drones or special forces or troop deployments will prove self-defeating and alter our country in troubling ways. Our systematic effort to dismantle terrorist organizations must continue. But this war, like all wars, must end. That's what history advises. That's what our democracy demands. This is a big historic speech. This is a turning point for the way America talks about its role in the world. A turning point that we knew would have to come someday, and that finally did come today, at least in terms of the way we're talking about it. In terms of what's going to happen next, the president had some specifics. Specifically, the president said today he wants to refine and then repeal the authorization for the use of military force. That was signed after 9-11, and that is still in effect. He says he will not sign laws to expand that thing. He said he will lift the moratorium on sending prisoners home from Guantanamo to Yemen. That's most of the prisoners left at Guantanamo. He says he wants Congress to lift the barriers that Congress has put in place to transferring other prisoners out of Guantanamo. He says he has told the Pentagon to pick a site in the United States for military commissions to be held here. They will be held here and no longer at Guantanamo. He says he has ordered a review of Justice Department guidelines for spying on reporters as part of leak investigations. He says he wants a review of proposals for more oversight when we kill people outside of war zones, like with drones. He's putting a senior envoy in charge of trying to close the prison at Guantanamo again, even though that didn't work the last time he did it. All of those plans and the president declaring that the global war on terror is not got to be ended someday, this is a big deal, what happened today. This has been a long time in coming. Joining